Hi, this is Pastor John coming to you from the Meditation Gardens here at the Gender Road Christian Church, and I'm glad that you've chosen to take the time to, to watch and participate in the message that God has for you today. One of the ways that you can do that is definitely follow along in your Bible, read the Scripture, pray that the Holy Spirit helps you understand it in a new way. So let's get started. Too hot. So we're glad that you are here today. There's a lot going on. It's the second Sunday of the month, and so our youth will be in the service the uh, whole uh, time with us today, and then the summer session of Sunday school will be uh, back up again next Sunday. And today is also every second Sunday. We have our pancake, eggs, and bacon breakfast. I was just back there, and it smells really good, so... Um, welcome to be there. And here come our acolytes, bringing in the light of Christ. Good job, boys. Each one of you can grab a candle. You want to grab this one over here? There you go. Very good. Yep. Thank you. You can um, slide that little thing down, or you can blow it out, however you want to do that. Good job. Thank you for helping today. If you're here, uh, today is the last Sunday. Joanne needs these envelopes back if you want to uh, provide something for the Father's Day Bulletin that is normally there. Um, we also have uh, the visitor card information as well as our um, blue prayer requests, or you can use this as a symbol of your online giving. What else was I supposed to mention? Yes, uh, Margaret Bonner fell this week, broke her pelvis, so she is in Mount Carmel East, and she will be, be being transferred somewhere soon, um, but her birthday is Tuesday, and um, do you know how old she will be on Tuesday? Yes, 101. She will be 101 on Tuesday, so if you could send her... Her spirits are really uh, low right now, and if you could just send her a birthday card, send it to her home address, and they'll make sure she gets the cards, uh, but that would just be really helpful. And then when we get into prayer requests, we'll take other prayers and, and so forth. So um, will you, how are we going to do the kids? You got this? I got it. All right. Charlotte's got it from here. All right. Turn around. What do I have in my hand? I have nothing up my sleeve, right? It's a dumbbell. It's a dumbbell. <laughs> this dumbbell weighs about five pounds. Oh my gosh. Who wants to hold it? Excellent. Okay, you got it? Do you want to hold it? You can hold it. Yeah. All right, there you go. Good. What do I have in my hand? This is a dumbbell. Can you tell me how much that says? 40 pounds. 40 pounds, which is approximately 10 times that weight, almost. Oh Don't gosh. grade me. All right? Okay, got it? Good. So, who do you think is holding more weight? I didn't have any problem doing that. Oh, dang. There we go. Good. Now, what I've been told is, do you, do you feel a little off balance? Yeah. Okay. Well, good. I can help with that. <laughs> okay. There you go. Got that one? Don't drop it on your toe. All right. Step forward here so everyone can see you. Excellent. Very good. All right. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, and our liturgist is going to read it. I'm the liturgist. <laughs> uh, this is Luke 7, verses 36 to 50. It's our first lesson. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, 
weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Okay, hey, Jack. Let's sure. stop right there. Sure. <laughs> so, let's say hypothetically in this parable... To help illustrate, Max, come on, man, you gotta keep holding us. <laughs> so we have here where somebody has, you know, owes a lot of money, like 500, about 10 times more than the other. All right. So let's say hypothetically, to help illustrate this point, we were to have two volunteers in our service, one holding a lot of weight and one holding the other. Hypothetically, right? So if I were to tell them to put the weight down, who do you think is going to be most pleased in doing that? <laughs> okay, you can put the weight down. <laughs> who says Jack would be the most pleased? Who says Max is probably happy? <laughs> All right, thank you, boys. You can sit down. You can leave those there. There are. I continue to read. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Here ends the first lesson. Praise be to God. So in this reading, what questions do you have? That's a long set of verses, right? Max is thinking, wow, 36 to 50, and I got to hold the weights the whole time. Any questions about this text? We have a lot going on, don't we? Jesus is going to the house. He's been invited by the religious leader of the city to come in and eat dinner. Now, in those times when you were eating dinner, um, invited here, it's not like we would have today where you go into someone's private home and nobody can see you there. You, you would, people would have been gathering along the courtyard, the edges of the gates, looking in, trying to see, because this was like the big deal. Who was the Pharisee having dinner with? And he's having dinner with Jesus. Now, what happens right before here, in our reading from last week into this week, Jesus and his disciples have been interacting with John the Baptist's uh, messengers. And then also other people have been questioning, who is this Jesus? And they're, you know, they're being critical, they're critiquing. And they're saying, you know, John the Baptist, he was kind of a weird guy. He was out in the desert eating honey and locusts and wearing camel's hair. And so he must be, you know, off. And then here comes this Jesus. You know, he's supposed to be a prophet, right? And now he's hanging around and all he's doing is eating and drinking with people he shouldn't be eating and drinking with. The drunkards and people of the cities and the sinners, and so they're questioning and they're wondering. And so the Pharisee sort of wants to see a little bit more. And so he kind of is trying to set Jesus up and invites him to dinner. 
And then we get into this question of, um, what, what, what was the end of the point? What was the points Jesus was making? Hospitality. Hospitality. Very good. What else? What did, what did, it begins with an F, forgiveness, right? So forgiveness is involved here. And so we have to think about, okay, how is forgiveness involved here? Why was, um, what point was Jesus trying to make with forgiveness? And so we start to see a correlation where if someone is forgiven much, they're really happy and they show that. But if someone's forgiven of a little, how do they respond? And then Jesus so critiques also Simon where he gets into this issue of hospitality, which means that Simon really doesn't recognize who Jesus is. All right, so there's a lot to think about, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit. All right? Yep. Excellent. Let's say our prayer of illumination together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Last week we talked about that moment, that moment in our life that changes, we're going through our life, and that we have that moment where things take a turn. Generally, if they take a turn for the worse, it rocks our world, we're not sure what to do. But there's also that moment where we realize that Jesus shows up, that Jesus shows up. This week I was talking with two people. One person had gone in for what thought to be a routine doctor's visit and was diagnosed with a serious illness, unchangeable illness, that moment that changes you. I was talking with another person Cindy, her joy is in our bulletin in the prayers area. Cindy was diagnosed with cancer in the kidney. She was supposed to have her surgery in June, towards the end of June, to have her kidney removed. And it seemed like a long time to wait. And so they were able to remove her kidney on May 20th. I talked with Cindy, 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 I talked with Cindy, on Wednesday, because Tuesday she was going to her doctor to find out, based on the removal of the kidney, what was the diagnosis, more radiation, more chemo, what would have to happen. Her voice was full of joy, and she said, I'm praising Jesus because all the cancer is gone. They took out my kidney, and all the cancer is gone. It's so praise God, Definitely. But you see, it's that moment because, you know, she still had cancer. She still had to have the kidney removed, but the cancer is now gone. It was the most aggressive a form of cancer that she had in that kidney. It was within weeks of spreading into the lymph nodes and bursting out into the other kidneys and parts of her body. And the doctor said, had we not operated in May, had we waited until June, it would have been everywhere in your body it would have been a death sentence. You see, those moments where there's still good and bad in those moments, we learn to see. And Jesus sees us in those moments. Jesus sees what's happening in our text today because we deal with the agenda of the hypercritical. You ever have that person you run into that they just, you know, are always complaining about something, something's going on. You're never quite sure what's happening you see, that's who Simon is. He's got another agenda. He's critical of Jesus. He's saying, if you truly were the prophet that you say you were, you would know with whom you are interacting with. Because as Jesus is there and this woman who comes up who's a sinner, because Jesus is already being criticized of hanging out with the wrong crowd, you know, those drunks, those sinners, those tax collectors, those people who aren't in the in crowd, those people who are worthy. You see, those people that we all have in our mind, we have those people in our mind who are on that list that says they're really not worthy of God's love. They're really not worthy. We don't, we don't go around saying that because that would seem to be unchristian, but we all judge people. I was at the intersection yesterday. The guy was homeless, I could tell. He was coming up. I locked my van doors. I had my wife and kids. It's prudent to be safe, right? But what happens, we judge. It was hot out. We had extra Gatorade bottles from the baseball game. So we threw one out there to him as the light changed to give him something to drink. 
I judged. Thoughts went through my mind. We all have those because, see, that's what's happening here. We wonder, who is it okay to talk with? Sometimes we get upset. A friend of mine at another church, they're hosting an interfaith dialogue where they're having conversations with those of the Islam, Muslim faith. And some Christians don't like it. How could you talk with them? What's Jesus say in the Bible? You see, Jesus is always hanging out with those whom others say really not worthy. And now here's Simon. Now what happens is Luke lets us know that Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Simeon in Luke 2, 34, where it says the one will come who's going to be opposed by some, but reveals the inner thoughts. So Jesus knows what Simon is thinking, because Simon's like, Psh, if you knew what she was doing, what was going on, you, you're not a prophet. You wouldn't let her do that. Because what she was doing in terms of anointing Jesus' feet could also be interpreted as, you know, hey, I have other ideas, okay? But Jesus knows. And so Jesus puts out this parable, and Simon answers that he's wondering, well, do I, do I respond in the right way or not? Because it's obvious that the one who's had a lot forgiven of them is going to, to be most joyful. And that's what Luke's trying to help us understand is this woman who had so much forgiven of her responded gratefully, responded in love. And we don't know whether Jesus forgave her then, forgave her earlier on, but she knew that Jesus was there. She comes forward in this act of faith. She comes forward with boldness into a place where she was not going to be welcome or wanted because she had been touched by Jesus, saved by God, and was there to say, I am responding from the love that is within me based on the salvation and forgiveness that you, you've given me. And I know nothing else to do but to come in and say thank you. But Simon judges. And so there's part of us that's definitely like, yeah, you know, Simon kind of got what he had coming to him. You know, being all arrogant, looking down, right? Like, good for Simon. You got it. Jesus put him in his place. But you know what? Then... We're just like Simon, aren't we? Judging Simon unworthy. And that's sort of that trap that we fall into. Reverend Caroline Lewis says that you cannot determine your worth to Jesus by a calculation of your sins. And that's what Simon is trying to do. He's determining this woman is not worthy based on the sins. He's made up this little calculation, and we all fall into that same trap. Based on the sins I've done, I'm really not worthy. But that's not it. You are all worthy because of who you are, children of God, made in God's image. Now, some of us would say, well, you know, I really don't sin that much, so I'm probably a little more worthy. I mean, I'm certainly not like those people over there, right? I mean, come on, we're all thinking about the people we know that don't go to church, and they listen to different types of music, and maybe they even dress the same. Who's more worthy? Man, we all fall into that. And so here's the thing. This, this story has so much that we could go in so many different ways. The woman and Simon were the same, but they acted differently. The woman knew she needed forgiveness. Simon didn't see that he needed forgiven. Right? I don't think you really get that point. You're probably going to have to pray about that all week. Okay? She knew she needed forgiven. And she was forgiven. Jesus forgave her. Jesus brought to her salvation. And she was responding. Simon in no way recognized that he needed forgiven. So do we recognize our need to be forgiven? And what resonates or moves up, bubbles up with inside of us about our need to be forgiven? To ask for forgiveness. To give that to God. You see, that's where the difference is. We could all easily answer Simon, oh yeah, 
Of course she's really happy. She had a lot forgiven her because she was that type of person. Oh. But when we uh, realize how we're seen, all seen, in the eyes of God, we realize there's a need to be forgiven. And then what does that do to us as we realize that we are forgiven? Reverend David Lowe says, when you know yourself to be forgiven, you don't have time for judgment anymore. All you can do is be grateful. When you know yourself to be forgiven, you don't have time for judgment anymore. When you know yourself to be forgiven and the weight of the world has been set down, when that has been lifted off you, when you don't carry that guilt anymore, you don't have time to judge others because you're reaching out to the one who has touched you, who has saved you, has taken that burden off you. You are feeling something inside and you're like, thank God, God's goodness goes through all people. Thank you. How do I show that? How do I respond? When you are forgiven, how does that change you? When you know it, when you respond, amen. I love being outside and being surrounded by God's creation. And I pray that today's message has been a blessing in your life. And I look forward to hearing from you or someday being able to speak with you about how God has been part of your life today.